Welcome geometry. We are jumping into lesson 56 through 59 this week. Okay. So, um, before we jump into lesson 56, let's remember something we learned last week. So if I have a right triangle and I know that it's a 45, 45, 90, what are some special things I know about it? Well, I know that each of the legs are the same because it's 45, 45. So the relationship that I have is X, X, X square root of two, right? So that relationship is formed, and so I can easily find out other things about it just based on that relationship. Well, in our first lesson this week, we're taking something similar to that, but don't let it confuse you because it's not the same. So we're looking at a different type of relationship. So this time, it is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. All right, and it's super important that you guys understand that that means that one side, one side here is opposite the 30, opposite the 60, and then opposite the 90. So your book has a relationship, and that's on page 268. And if you'll take a look with me on page 268, it shows you the picture there. So whatever is opposite the 30, we label X. All right, and then whatever is opposite the 60, we label x square root of 3, and whatever's opposite the 90, we label 2x. All right, so I know that right now you're going to say, what? It looks a little bit confusing, but if you understand this relationship, you can easily solve it. Now, your book doesn't use x. It just uses um, 1, 2. But basically what they're saying is whatever side is opposite 30, the hypotenuse is going to be double that. Just multiply it times 2. And then whatever was opposite of 30, you're just going to multiply it times the square root of 3 to get 60. So let's look um, at some examples there. So um, I know that starting out, you're just thinking, do what? What does that look like? Well, here is practice A. And practice A, it gave us a triangle that's facing this way, all right? And it said this is 90. Then it gave us Y is the hypotenuse. It gave us 7 is opposite 60. And then X would be down here. It didn't tell us this, but if this is 60, that has to be 30. Now, what's really important is not to get overwhelmed and just start throwing out, out um, visuals at it. So if it's asking us what 30 is, we do know that opposite 30 is the X, right? But then opposite 60, it told us was seven. Well, that's gonna be X square root of three, right? So in this case, X equals square root of three. So I've gotta figure out what X is because I know Y is gonna be double the X. Y is two X because it's opposite the hypotenuse. So the only one that they gave us, the only side was opposite 60. And I know opposite the 60 is x square root of 3. So I'm just going to solve that. If x square root of 3 equals 7, I'm going to get x by itself. Divide through by square root of 3, and I end up with x equals 7 over the square root of 3. Now, from doing this in Algebra 1 and in Geometry, I know that I cannot leave a radical symbol in the denominator. So I've got to rationalize it. So x equals 7 square root of 3 over 3. So that is x. All right, so that means opposite the 30 equals 7 square root of 3 over 3. Now, what would y be? Well, y is simply double that. So 7 square root of 3 over 3 times 2. So it just ends up being 14 square root of 3 over three equals my Y. So I solved it and I got my two answers, all right? That's all that they're asking for is I just use this ratio to solve it. Now, you might say, Miss Kim, I have a hard time remembering that ratio. Well, you guys know it's got a 90 degree, so you could still use your trig functions, kind sine, cosine, and tangent. If you find one, you could still use A squared plus B squared equals C squared, your Pythagorean theorem. 
So there's always more than one way. This is just a shortcut. Now, in my classes that I've taught previously, everybody really likes the 45, 45, 90 because two sides are the same, right? So this one's a little bit messier, but it's not as difficult if, um, if you just um, take the time to be neat and watch your relationships there. Let's take a look at letter B. All right, letter B has a little bit different um, numbers there. So your triangle looks like this, and it's got a 90 degree, and it's asking for Y. Opposite of 30 is square root of 3, and they want to know what's opposite of 60. Now let's take a look. If opposite of 30 is square root of 3, I know that my relationship says opposite of 30 is X. So what I do, the first thing I do is I just go through and write my relationships. Opposite of 30 is X. Opposite of 60 is X times the square root of 3. And then opposite um, the 90 is 2X, right? So I know that X is square root of 3. What do I do when it's, um, in this case, X equals square root of 3 times the square root of 3? Well, that means X is 3. Right? So opposite the 60 would be 3. All right? Now I could plug that in and do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Or since I figured out that x is square root of 3, then this one would be 2 times the square root of 3. So that's y. All right? And again, it's just using your ratios. So if I remember that opposite of 30 is x, Opposite the hypotenuse is just double that. So opposite 30 was square root of 3. So opposite the hypotenuse was just double that. 2 times the square root of 3. Okay. Um, now they've given you a few more examples on lesson 56, C and D. And it's more of just um, using those relationships. So we're, we're going to keep on a moving. All right. Let's look at lesson 57. All right. And I, I would encourage you to take the time when you guys are solving these to uh, at least put this on a three by five card to kind of try to commit it to memory. But especially, um, it sure will make things like standardized tests. If you know that relationship, it will make it a lot easier. Now there's always more tools you can use, sine, cosine, and tangent. It's just that on a standardized test, like the ACT, you have one minute per problem. So if you know that relationship, it can shorten that time for you. All right, lesson 57, it says find the perimeter and area with coordinates. Now let's talk about this. Perimeter is the distance on the outside of something, right? And so if you're finding the perimeter and say, say they've given you like a rectangle, they gave you on page 374, on page 375, they gave you a triangle. So the biggest issue you're gonna have with these is that you just have to ensure that you're finding your distance formula. So, and the biggest um, issue I see with young people, um, with high school students doing the distance formula is their signs. So I really do want to encourage you guys, watch your signs when you're on the coordinate plane and um, your distance formula. Uh, let's write that down so you can put that in your notes. Distance equals the square root, and then you're doing x2 minus x1, and you're squaring it. Then you're adding together y2, minus y1 and that is squared. Then uh, you're adding those two together, right? You're finding the difference in your x's, you're squaring it, finding the difference of your y, squaring it, adding them together, and then square rooting the total. Remember that the distance formula has a root in the Pythagorean theorem. And where that comes from is if I'm finding the distance of this line, well, how I find it is I do the change in x, the change in y, there's your a, there's your b, and then I'm doing a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and then to find that distance, I just square root the c squared. So that's where this distance formula comes from is roots in the Pythagorean theorem. All right, then um, your book is asking you to find the perimeter. Well, once you would find the distance of this, the distance of this, and the distance of this, you would just add those perimeters together. So in lesson 57, you're not just doing the distance formula, but you're going to be doing the distance formula multiple times. So that's what's important. All right, 
Um, on page 376, it also shows you how to estimate area. Now, um, honestly, I don't think you're going to see this as much in standardized testing. Um, I taught middle school math, and I saw it a lot on, in, in, we live in the state of Tennessee, so we saw it a lot on TCAPs in the middle school um, that I taught at. Um, they would have like shapes like that and you would have to estimate and you would have to think, okay, I have this many whole boxes in the area and then I have like four halves, which would make two more. So um, you're going to see that a little bit more. I don't know that I've seen that on high school um, ACT things um, just because they're more into like formulas like the distance formula and things like that rather than just eyeballing area. But your book is still nonetheless trying to show you how to approximate area by about how many square units that it covers. So um, lesson, uh, lesson 57, example four, shows you a lot of that, of how you're trying to figure out approximation, especially when it's not an exact box, you know, when you're, when you're trying to think through. So they gave you an application in farming, and it showed you a farmer um, that wants to estimate how much seed she needs to buy for her land. And there's a river bank, so she's trying to think through about how many. And, you know, I can imagine if you're a farmer and you're trying to think through seed, that's a hard thing if you're just thinking, well, I've got, you know, 14 acres or 10 acres or, or whatever. So about how many of it can I do? All right. So um, let's look at our practice. And we're on page uh, 378. And it's asking us to find the perimeter of a rectangle. All right. So let me uh, try to approximate that here on my board. All right, that's the hard thing is um, on a board, I'm, I wish that I had a graphing uh, actual board. That sure would make life beautiful, wouldn't it? One, two, three, four, five. So I've got negative five, positive three is my L. Then I've got M is negative five, negative one is my M. So I've got LM. Now, N is 4, positive 4, and negative 1. So, here's my N. And then O would be positive 4, positive 3. All right. What's super nice about this is they are all vertical or horizontal lines. So, it's going to make finding this super easy. So, I'm not even truly going to need my distance formula now, if I were using doing a triangle, I would for sure, but I'm just going to count. One thing I want to remind you is don't forget to count the origin. So if I'm starting here, I went one, two, three, four, five to the origin, six, seven, eight, nine. So if this is nine. This also is nine. I know that because the definition of a rectangle, but also you can tell on my shape that it was. Now I'm starting here and going down one, two, three, four. Don't forget to count the origin. So my distance is, uh, they did not tell me units, but I always want to make sure that I put units. It's just perimeter. And remember the perimeter of a rectangle is 2L plus 2W. So perimeter equals 2 times 9 plus 2 times 4. So the perimeter in this case is 18 plus 8. So perimeter equals 26. And it is units. It's not area so it's not unit squared so that's all that it's asking for there now letter b they're asking for the perimeter of a triangle and this one's a little bit more difficult and it says round your answer to the nearest hundredth so this is going to take a few extra minutes so i think it's important that we set this up especially to make sure we understand this for coming lessons all right so um, my highest is nine so let me try to try to draw that and make sure you're sketching this at home while I'm doing this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. And then the lowest it goes is negative four. Negative four. One, two, three. All right. So don't forget, this is my X. This is my Y. So it's asking P is positive four, negative one. That is my P. All right, Q is nine, three. That's Q. And then R is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And negative four. 
And that, my friends, was R. All right, so it's P, Q, R. All right, so uh, not, um, not super easy there, is it? Because nothing is like letter A where it was just exactly, you know, the X's or the Y's counted out. So what do I have to do? I actually have to use the distance formula two times, or excuse me, three times. I was hoping that with a triangle that I'd only have to use it once and I could, you know, use the other two. But unfortunately, it's not. So I, I actually have to set up my distance formula. So I actually need to know these points. Um, and I should have written them down, but I did not because I, I just I just put the dots up there. But let's uh, let me write that nine three. So that way I remember nine three. And then this one was um, four negative one, four negative one. And then R was six negative four, six negative four. All right. So in order to find those distances, I'm just going to do what it says. So x2 minus x1. So I'm just going to say 9 minus 4. And you're, you're going to have to watch. So the distance of um, PQ is the first one that I'm doing. So the distance of PQ, and I'm saying this is point 2, this is point 1. So 9 minus 4, so it's the square root of 9 minus 4 squared. 9 minus 4. Notice this order because I did x2, then x1. Then I've got to do the next one, 3 minus negative 1. And again, watch your signs. 3 minus a negative 1 is going to make it positive. 9 minus 4. So that's going to be 5 squared plus 4 squared. So 25 plus 16. So together, that's going to be... 341. So the square root of 41 is the distance here. Now um, I'm going to do it for two more sides. Then don't forget for your perimeter, you're then going to add all those up. And your final answer, you round to the nearest hundredth. I would not round it now because if I round this one, round this one, and round that one, your answer will be rounded three whole times. And we definitely do not want that. So the, the uh, more precise the answer is, the least amount of time that it is rounded. So uh, that is super important that you guys uh, take the time to, to look over that. So uh, again, this is uh, lesson 57, and you're finding the dis distance of all of those. So um, I did the first one, which is a square root of 41, and there are two more. Um, and this one is the longer of the two legs, but your hypotenuse will be a little bit longer. So again, you're going to have to do it three times because you're finding the distance. My board's not that big, and I don't think you guys are going to have a hard time. The biggest issue I've seen young people have, though, is they change the order. If I started 9 minus 4, you can't then go negative 1 minus uh, 3. You've got to watch your order because um, w that order of... X, this X was X2, so this has to be Y2. So make sure you're watching that order there. I've seen students mix that up on slope as well. All right, um, so that is everything on lesson 57, and I'm, I'm gonna give you all um, time to, to finish that at home. Now, we have tangents and circles, and there's part one and part two. So uh, I wanna spend just a, a few moments um, looking over that. Now remember, that a tangent to a circle means that it just touches in one place. So it cannot cross over. So let, let's talk about this. So remember we talked about that this is a chord because it doesn't go through it. Now I had the center point, this would be a radius. If it goes through the center and to the other side, that's a diameter. Um, but uh, this is not a tangent. A tangent can only touch it in one place. So that would be the point of tangency, right? It just touches it in one place. So your book says, if a line is tangent to a circle, and I'm on page 381, I'm on theorem 58.1, then the line is perpendicular to a radius drawn to the point of tangency. So uh, very interesting that uh, whatever, um, whatever the point of tangency is, you can draw a radius to the circle, and that would be 
um, 90 degrees uh, here from that uh, point of tangency. So that's what your, your book is showing you is that there can be a radius drawn that is perpendicular to the line of tangency. All right, look at page uh, 382. If a line in the plane of a circle is perpendicular to the radius at its end point on the circle, then the line is tangent. So we're just looking at, at the inverse of that, of how they relate to each other. All right, now what's really interesting is on page um, 383, it says if two tangent segments are drawn to, um, to a circle from the same exterior point, then they are congruent. So um, uh, they're, they're just showing you there that those two would be congruent if they're drawn to the same exterior point. So it's outside of it. So that's on page 383. So there's a lot of relationships that you can see there. If you'll look at example four on page 383, and you might see something like this on a standardized test where they're asking, hey, how do you solve this? Well, you'll know that there's a relationship of all radiuses are congruent. So I know on example four, if one of the radiuses is eight inches, the other radius also has to be eight inches. Now, it also shows um, that K and M are points of tangency from the exterior point J. Well, if KJ is 17 inches, then also JM has to be 17 inches. So uh, it's, it's uh, just really neat relationships that are formed there. And I know right now you're going, well, when am I ever going to use this? But you might find something on an ACT test that's asking you, hey, what about this? How do I use it? How do I apply? So let's take a look at our lesson practice. Um, our lesson practice for um, uh, lesson 58, our next to last lesson, says line A is tangent to circle R at D. Um, the line B passes through R. Um, line A and B intersect at E. If the measure of RED is 42, determine the measure of DRE. Wowzers. All right. So um, not too difficult if we just take the time to break each part down. Right. So let's uh, let's do that together. Um, so again, this is uh, lesson 58 and it is practice A. So um, it, it sure does have a lot uh, that it's trying to go over with us. So the first thing is we're looking at circle R. I'm sorry, friends. Y'all know that I love to teach you um, geometry. I'm just not good at drawing. So we have to pretend that that's a circle that meets, right? <laughs> All right. It's a uh, it's rough looking right there at the corner, so I apologize. All right, so then it talks to us about, um, it talks to us that there is a tangent here at D. So we're going to go ahead and write D here. So then it has this line, D. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure it's straight. And this is E. And um, it's telling us that at E, All right, this is line B, this is line A. So I've got D, E, and it's telling us that this is 42 degrees. All right, so one thing that we need to understand is by theorem's definition, that here to here would be 90 degrees, right? So it asks us to find out, it says, well, let's read back through. At, uh, line A is tangent to uh, circle R at D. So there's point D. Uh, line B passes through R. That's the center. Um, lines A and B intersect at E. So we have that there. If RED is 42 degrees, determine DRE. So we're looking for this. This is my question right here, DRE. Well, I know that according to the theorem, this has to be 90 degrees and this is 42. So I've just made a triangle. So I know 180 minus my right is going to give me 90. So 42 taken away from that is going to leave me with 48 degrees. So the measure of angle D R E equals 
48 degrees. So that's all that they're asking us there. But it, it sure did take a few minutes to, to break all that down, right? Okay, let's look at uh, letter B. If, if segment CA, uh, or excuse me, let segment CA be a radius of C, all right? And then let line M be tangent at circle C at A. Let B be an exterior point of circle C with a measure of BAC. Um, let B be an exterior point of C with the measure of BAC being less than 90. Is AB a tangent to C? Why or why not? Well, we know by the theorem that it has to be 90 degrees. So, um, if BAC, it, it says BAC is less than 90. So, if it's less than 90, then it can't be tangent. Does that make sense? So, um, letter B is just uh, reminding us that it has to be 90 degrees to be tangent. So, that's all that letter B is asking us is, is this um, able to be tangent? So, you guys can see from our lesson so far, we're doing 56, 57, and then this was 58 about... Um, a, a line that's tangent will be um, 90 degrees. So 90 degrees at a radius. I do want to point out to you there is lab eight and that's on page uh, 387. All right, and then the last lesson, lesson 59, is um, finding surface area and volume of a prism. Now let's not forget that um, a prism, in order to be um, a prism, it just means that the bases are the same. So we would say that this is a rectangular prism because both the base is the same. Now in Algebra 1 in Saxon, when they were um, telling you to find the surface area, they just broke down all six faces. Well, you guys know there's also a formula for that. Surface area equals 2 capital B, and all that means is 2 times the area of the base. So since this is the top, the, the base, and this is the bottom, in order to find the surface area, there's two of them, the top and the bottom. Then you find the perimeter of the base. That's what capital P stands for, perimeter of the base. And then you multiply it times the height, and that gives you all this side, the back, the front, and both sides. Add those together, and that gives you the surface area of the entire prism. All right. Then the volume of any prism is just capital B, H and capital B just means the area of the base. So if it's a, a rectangular prism, it would just be length times width times height. Don't forget that volume is always units cubed and surface area is always units squared. So that is super important. And I know that you have done that before in um, Algebra 1. But um, Saxon is pointing that out to us and also reminding us of our formulas. So your formulas are on page 389 and page 390. So uh, they're, they're pointing out to you different prisms and how to solve those. So uh, look at your lesson practice on page 392. It says find the lateral area of the prism. So all they're asking is um, for you to find... Um, the, the side area, that's what lateral means. Now, um, letter B says find the surface area of the prism. All right, so uh, this is uh, lesson uh, 59. So let's just skip to um, the, well, part A, they told you to find the perimeter and to find those, they broke it down. But you guys know that if I'm solving, um, it told me that seven, and nine were my bases and they were yards. I'm just finding the area of those two bases. So nine times seven is 63. So it would just be 63 is the area of one, but because I have two of them, I'm gonna have to double it. And then I would find the perimeter of that, which would be 18 plus 14. So 18 plus 14 is my perimeter and then multiply it times the height of 15. And then I would just plug all that in together. And so um, the surface area would end up being 480 plus, uh, this is 126. 
And so I end up with 606 yards squared. So 400 is over here when I multiply it times 15. Don't forget your final answer always has to be unit squared. On practice B, it's asking us um, yards, so it is yards squared. So that is your um, that is your surface area, and that's what it's asking in lesson 59. Now, um, lesson 59, letter C, it says find the volume of this right prism. Now, we need to be careful because that's a pentagonal prism. Letter D, find the volume of this um, prism. Now, notice that it is a triangular prism. So, I'm go going to have to find that anytime that I'm finding the volume, I find the area of the base times the height. In this case, it's not length times width. The volume, uh, in order to find this, I'm going to have to find the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height then the height of the whole prism. This is the height of the base. So super important to watch your shapes and know what you're doing with those. But again, just use those formulas, plug and chug. So you guys will do a great job.